Well, hello, creatives, community, and kind folks. Welcome to RPG with DBJ. We are going to do something very strange because I end up getting a a, a mental, the equivalent of a mental earwig, and I couldn't get it out of my head. And <clears throat> this week we're talking about the hero's journey, the heroine's labyrinth, the journey in the labyrinth. This is a framework primarily used for novelization. And I thought we would take a look at it and find out if it was a, th this week and find out if it's actually a great format for adventure design and tabletop role playing games. And for anyone who's um, seen the thousands of videos on this channel, will know that uh, pop culture and uh, I'm I'm influenced by many things in pop culture that help us basically make better uh, have a lot more fun and uh, become inspired by things for our tabletop role-playing games. It, it, uh, role-playing games for me is a great format um, like science fiction for speculative thought. And one thing that has uh, really delved in my mind was an old series. Uh, these are old podcasts. This was a book written by a gentleman talking about the 11 nations of America. And it came back up on my feed, probably because my phone and computer was listening to my conversations. Uh, that's something else. But for this particular element of a uh, uh, in our journey through tabletop role-playing games, um, because this show broadcasts so early in the morning here in the States, often people who... Um, tune into the channel or from overseas and and many times at the very end of the show we talk about some some kind of um similar similarities and differences in cultures especially on our discord group uh with different nations and i was like well, wait a minute there's actually a way to describe here in the united states what if we use the presupposition of the 11 nations of america of the united states as a foundation for a world in which we can uh, engage in both having journeys and labyrinths and i thought we would combine it all together so let's begin with our first part here so here we have an image this this image to uh to um, my left is an image of the generalized cultural ethnic and political breakdowns of the united states and um and the americas in general as you can see that it blends down into um, south of the United States into the Caribbean and up into Canada. And this, the gentleman's name is um, Colin Woodard that has a book known, uh, here we go with the title, American Nations, A History of the 11 Regional Rival Regional Cultures of North America, or better known as the 11 Nations, and about how they were settled and how they think. I think we can use that as some some fuel for for fantasy gaming. So allow me to uh, do me the uh, the honor of allowing me to show this to you. So I'm going to zoom in, and let's see if we can get into zoom in really good here in the United States. And m mind you, you'll see some of these uh, white lines here set up with the different states within the United States, but the region spread far across that. And this gentleman has kind of broken down these nations in terms of their like beliefs and who settled them and what their purposes were before. And um, in his treaties, he basically says that people don't necessarily move and take their beliefs with them. What they do is they move to a place that agrees with their uh, social structures. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I wonder if we could kind of make this into a fantasy uh, fantasy kind of thing. So here we, we're going to start in Yankee them or Greater New England. And here in Wikipedia, uh, a breakdown from this gentleman's book, he says, uh, began with the Puritans, Yankee them, began with the Puritans or Calvinist English settlers in New England and spread across upper New York, the northern parts of Pennsylvania, Ohio, where I'm living currently, and I was born and raised in PA. Um, Indiana, Illinois, and Iowa into the eastern Dakotas, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and the Canadian Maritime. The area values education, communal decision-making, and aims at creating a religious utopian communal society to spread over other 
regions. And even in the Insider, it says some, something similar, encompassing the entire northeast north of New York City and spreading through Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. They value education, intellectual achievement, communal empowerment, and citizen participation in government as a shield against tyranny. Yankees are comfortable with government regulation. Woodard notes that Yankees have a utopian streak. The area was settled by radical Calvinists. And for me, I'm thinking that like a place, um, a location like that um, really lends itself to, to uh, lawful um, communal where it's, it's, it's less about the self and more about the community. And one of the ways to navigate this kind of location might be very social. Um, people who are uh, very prideful, um, full of themselves, trying to advance themselves without regards to other people might stick out like a sore thumb. And I can see having uh, great libraries, Maybe there are uh, w wizards schools, actual schools, instead of just like a, a wizard taking on a, a few apprentices. These, these might be actual official, um, official colleges like Bardic colleges and things of that nature where people learn. And I could see there being um, there might even be like a dark undertone where better for people to sacrifice or martyr themselves for the greater good and keep things hidden down down deep. Uh, here in the United States, there's a lot of uh, historical buildings, and um, history is very much cherished as well. So um, ancient beings, such as um, ancient uh, vampires, liches, uh, mummies, um, ancient beings, undead, or people looking to become immortal to see their great works uh, um, finished, and, you know, no one wants to, to die knowing that never seeing their great works completed. And I could see that being an undercurrent here as well. Um, old buildings, crypts, things of that nature, even even crypts and things that are taken care of and well tended, I would see would be a great thing. If you want to go even more arcane with it, I could see there that uh, Im immortals of many types might walk publicly amongst the people to see their see the people and how their great work is done. All right, let's move let's move on to mm, 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 mm. it's what's the next one? Oh, uh, here we go. The next one is the Deep South. We're gonna go to Deep South. Let's go to let's let's go right next door. Let's go to New Netherland. So New Netherland is a highly commercial culture. Uh New Netherland is materialistic with a profound tolerance for ethnic and religious diversity, and an unflinching commitment to the freedom of inquiry and conscience. Uh, it is a natural ally with Yankeedom and, and encompasses New York City, northern New Jersey. The area was settled by the Dutch. And, uh, oh, let's see what else they say about it. Um, est yeah, established by Dutch colonists in the 17th century, is now greater New York City, as well as the lower Hudson Valley, northern New Jersey, Western Long Island and Southwest Connecticut. The area embodies liberal multicultural values, capitalism, and the freedom of the press. And there is there is this uh, th there is a little bit of a um, a little bit of a dichotomy, I guess you could say. What some people might say with the um, New Netherlands, because it does spread like. Where I'm, I'm living here. I used to live in Pennsylvania here, and then I kind of moved out, moved a little further west into the Ohio Valley. And the top end of Ohio, as considered in this map, is very much New Netherland, and then it goes, starts to spread. Oh, ooh, over here, and then we. Oh, it's Midlands here in New Netherland. It's kind of small. Let's see if we can zero in on it. There we go, and it is kind of cool with having like both multicultural and materialism and i could see this being a, an extreme metropolis in a fantasy world where you have beings from different um, realms and regions and um uh, planes of existence and things like that you know um a, a halfling crime lord with uh, you know a minotaur and a an etten as bodyguards and things uh liz lizard folk who you know have control the shipping lanes and uh, they're having, you know, 
simple conversations with gnolls and bugbears, you know, because they're having a, I, I don't know, union negotiations or something. Uh, I could see a very, very metropolis, a metropolitan, ethnically diverse fantasy, fantasy gaming wise um, combination of things, but also very materialistic. Everything might have a price here. And I could see this being crime, uh, politically driven, um, religiously driven, where there, there's so much freedom that there might be a little bit too much. And to control that, it's about the money. So if you're not of value, if you or people who are brand new to the city might be taken advantage of to gain other people more power, influence, and money in this particular region. And of course, the the image of New York City and sky rises, I could see that being very fantasy in in. The city of Sharn, Eberron has the city of Sharn. It's a, it's a towering city with, you, you know, so so tall that at at its highest peaks, even pieces and chunks of the tower of like floating above the people that live below. And I very much feel like New Netherland would very much be that way in, as an adventure. And for getting back to our heroes and journeys, I could see small town heroes going to the big city to see these things and recontextualizing many of the the uh, monstrous races and beasts and animals and things becoming very metropolitan and being able to basically live in a big giant city uh, stacked on top of each other would be a very good great way to recontextualize how uh, monsters are used like for example maybe uh you know a medusa and her bodyguards you might be very rich cuz she has an an artist studio and walks up and down the streets hey there drew uh walks up and down the streets like no big thing just with a a, a veiled face as a medusa and no one everyone just shrugs and the re everyone else that that comes from fantasy worlds that uh villages that comes to like the new netherland region it's like what the hell but here it just might be a new just a regular old thing you know basically throwing alignment completely out the window and people living together. Uh, so that's uh, Yankeedom, uh, basically the, the presupposed utopia uh, of a fantasy setting. Uh, New Netherland would be more uh, metropolitan, uh, huge population, people, money, cash rules everything around me, cream, get the money, right? Dollar, dollar bill, right? So that, that could be the, the region. So let's move on to Tidewater and let's see what Tidewater has. Um, again, today looking at a, a book and a map of the 11 nations of America and um, using that as a foundation for our hero's journey and our labyrinths and things. So let's see what Tidewater, here we go. So Tidewater was founded by uh, cavaliers or royalists during the era of the English Civil War and Stuart Restoration, of, of which I have very little information, and consists of Virginia, Maryland, uh, Southern Delaware, and Eastern North Carolina, has cooperated often with Deep South and Greater Appalachia. Together with George Washington, many of the founding fathers came from here. Appalachian Mountains cut its expansion westwards, and the region is now being overrun by the Midlands. And uh, what? Let's see what this this other article say. Uh, Tidewater was built by young English gentry in the area around the Chesapeake Bay and uh, North Carolina. Starting as a feudal society that embraced slavery, the region places a high value on respect for authority and tradition. Uh, Woodard, the writer of the book, notes that Tidewater is in decline partly because, quote, it has been eaten away by the expanding federal halos around D.C. and Norfolk. And so here around Tidewater... Um, ad adventure wise, I could see Tidewater being a region where um, a great nobility came from afar, which in, in reality it did. But in our fantasy realm, these might be beings that came from far away and settled here, or they might have lived here for a long time and respect for uh, nobility, uh, the gentry, a, a stiff upper lip. I'm I'm thinking of Netflix's um, a world of Netflix's um, 
Oh, Bridgerton. Um, great civility, but underneath it is is uh, harsh realities. And um, I could see that being a, a, a thing. Now, in fantasy, yes, I know buzzwords, slavery and such. But th the only way to have our great heroes delve into their journey and, and deep dive into the labyrinth is to have an enemy to fight against. And that may be culturally entrenched and the heroes may come from afar or they might even be here and maybe they escape uh, from the tyranny of the nobility that lives here. Now, the to the very west of this region known as the Tidewater are the Appalachian Mountains and it's extremely hilly, difficult terrain, and could be a great place for where our um, Robin Hood and Merry Band of Thieves hide out when fighting against the the tyranny that lives down here in Tidewater. Also down here in Tidewater, uh, difficult to, to zoom in on, but there's a there is a lot of inlets, and it is a great place for uh, safe harbors. So. Um, lots of ships, nav naval interaction, piracy, um, uh, swamplands, things of that nature as well. And so I think a, a lot of uh, the environment can be used in terms of where player characters can go to hide out maybe uh, or to run from. Hey, Drew, uh, I think you'll follow along and see what the heck's going on here. Um, but I, I believe like Tidewater is a great place for... Um, having big, big bad evils, living in like like being dressed to the nines and speaking in in very civilized uh, tones, um, not overt threats, but um, having intellectual conversations, knowing that great horrors are maybe going around them, and so um, ha having some of the more uh, having some of the 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 deeper elements of uh, deeper and more dangerous elements of fantasy happening here, a uh, very civilized. Oh, when you go there, maybe you're very welcome, but you find out that people are being treated, uh, mistreated. And what a great place for uh, a journey, especially players who are uh, players, uh, player characters who have been captured or they are uh, brought in from a distant place and, and brought here, or maybe the player characters have traveled very far and they get here, and on the surface, they go, oh, this is a great place to live, and they realize maybe not. Uh, don't worry, Drew, you're, you're not at a loss. I'm, I'm, I've am i actually confused everyone. <laughs> AJ says, old money yuppies who can't build anything for themselves, so just <laughs> yes, who justify their, their exploitation of more capable others as being inferior to them. Um, Very, very good, some, uh, very excellent summarization of of the Tidewater area. It is ex extremely like that. Now in modern day, it is extremely politically charged. It's location of uh, Washington, D.C. and the greater area. And uh, in Woodard's book, he kind of surmises that it's kind of being taken over that way. But to be honest with you, uh, just because it's being taken over doesn't mean it's changed much, <laughs> right? So a AJ puts it at a perfect spot. So now we're going to go down to the Deep South. Um, again, I'm taking a look at a, a generalization by a gentleman named Colin Woodard who wrote a book about the 11, uh, the 11 American nations. And it's, the book is far more political and ethnic in the way people have like settled in the United States. And I was like, um, and I, and for me, I was like, why not? We, why don't we just turn this into fantasy? Right. We're always trying to figure out ways to get inspired. And since we were talking about the hero, the, the, the journey and the labyrinth, I'm saying, well, why, why not have a place to go journeying and labyrinthing, <laughs> right? So let's get into the, the Deep South. So here we have the Deep South. And mind you, uh, these are all uh, generalizations, but whatever. You know, every, the, min, the, the, the larger the population, the larger area, the more general you're going to have to get. So here I've got two articles. Uh, I got Wikipedia and an article set up. So Deep South says, was settled by former Anglo-American West Indies plantation owners in Charleston, right, AJ, and spread to encompass South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, Louisiana, Western Texas, uh, I'm sorry, Western Tennessee, and the southeastern parts of North Carolina, Arkansas, and Texas. It values old 
Greco-Roman enlightened, civilized, idle slave society, free markets, and individual freedoms. It has fought centuries with Yankeedom over the dominance of North America, such as the Civil War and the culture wars started by the civil rights movements since the 1960s. Uh, what, what else do we have here? We also have... Uh, Yep, Deep South established by English slave lords from, from Barbados and was styled as a West Indies style slave society. It has a very rigid social structure and fights against government regulation that threatens individual liberty. Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, Texas, Georgia, South Carolina are all part of the Deep South. Um, we haven't, leaving AJ's comment up here, we haven't, using this this map, we haven't traveled very far away from from uh, the, the, the tyranny of uh, like uh, slavery and work and things of that nature. I think the difference here, since we're talking about fantasy between the deep South and um, and the, the Tidewater would be that in Tidewater, there is a, a nobility and social structure that is entrenched. And the deep South is more or less like individualized. In, in other words, this is where you would have warlords that have settled their own region and want to make their own rules, um, maybe even copying, copying and pasting the, the the nobility from like the Tidewater. But I could see that being like this. This is where you you get uh, Mad Maxing, right? Mad Max realms where people just settle their own and make their own rules, and you're going to work for here, uh, work here for us the way we want and the way we have it now. Uh, it is extremely culturally entrenched. So there, there might be uh, very many social structures involved. Since we're talking about the hero's journey, journeying through here, part of the labyrinth is about having this, um, the context of social structures. There may be certain ways you greet people. Um, there are, there may be many rules about, um, you, you know, as, as long as you, are invited into our home. You have 70, 72 hours of peace. As long as you don't, uh, you know, th that social structure might be there. I won't harm you. You won't harm me for 72 hours. You're welcome to stay here. But afterwards, we might be bloody enemies or something. Um, I could also see traveling from, you know, Deep South has plantations and things of that nature. Since we're talking fantasy, I could see this region being um, on the outside, having like a lot of harvesting and, um, plant life, and it may seem on the outwards like, oh, this is the region why the reason why this fantasy realm is even accepted is because it feeds everybody else, and that might be the reason why when the players go down there, it's like, wow, oh wow, fruited, um, fruited plains of grain and and uh, oranges and things like that. Wow, what a great place to live! Until the owners come by and are like. Would you like to work here? We've got some chains, right? AJ says, carve out your, your little empire built on the sweat and blood of others. New money. Yep. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. I, I could see up in the tie where you have ancient individuals like um, mummies, liches, um, vampires, um, uh, outer worldly beings that are, are ancient. I could see in the deep south uh, mortals who think that they want to become immortal and make their own petty empires. Um, also, maybe some of the short-lived races keep fighting over the same plots of land over and over again to be to dominate over the same peoples. Uh, the classic goblinoid, uh, goblinoid chieftain turnover rate, right? Where they, you know, they only have a 30 to 50 year lifespan because they keep getting killed by the next person who takes over and the next person who takes over. But the people, you know, held under their thumb remains the same. And I could see that happening very much. Um, let, let's go, let's continue to go further down South and down, down South here to New France. Now I'm, I'm gonna move this map a little bit, a little bit quickly. New France here also extends up north out to the upper tip of the the states and into Canada. So let, let's go into New France and then we'll we'll move on to uh absolutely what you guys have to say. So let's see New France. Uh began in 1604 with an expedition by uh France led by Pierre du Dugois. 
uh, it grew to encompass D U G U A, du, uh, Pierre Dugois. I'm going to pre pre presume it began to encompass the lower third of Quebec, uh, Quebec and North and Northeast New Brunswick and Southern Louisiana. Um, mm, 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 new far west, no. New France, a pocket of liberalism nestled in the deep south, its people are consensus-driven, tolerant, and comfortable with government involvement in the economy. Uh, Woodard says New France is among the most liberal places in North America. New France is focused around New Orleans in Louisiana, uh, Nolens, <laughs> as well as the Canadian province of Quebec. And I could see... Uh... <laughs> AJ said, I have a feeling it would not be... <laughs> yeah, here we, here we go with the... the... Uh, suppositions of where people live and um oftentimes people that don't like each other tend to be more tend to be more similar than we give them credit for right uh but i could see new france uh region fantasy wise as being um it, well i one way could be that it's under constant attack in fantasy realms normally the the air quotes goodish and lawful peoples tend to be smaller and well fortified or trying to be well fortified and i could see this being a place of um, enlightenment and against because the, the the simple fact is according to this map and if we're going to use fantasy realm here that they might be under constant assault uh socially politically uh even economically and of course um uh, with physical conflict from the deep south that's above it. Also, yeah, <laughs> AJ says a magical portal network connects vastly different regions. Uh, absolutely. We often, in fantasy, how many times have we had portals to the nether realms? Who's to say there isn't one to the, the goodly realms as well? Trying to, to you, know, you know, the the heralds and paladins of the world setting their flag down and going, hey, we want to be an enlightened world. We're, we're here with peace and art and and that kind of things. And New Orleans is known as being a party realm. Maybe this is far more, it, instead of uh, in, an entrenched knighthood, maybe this is a realm of free thinkers, people who are escaping from the, 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 the more treacherous places to come here and they want to live free. And I could see in using the, the hero's journey and labyrinth, maybe the labyrinth idea is player characters must be entrench themselves in this society and dig out the evil that might be trying to grow here. And then for the journey, players may have to come from distant regions to come here and um, recruit the great warriors and um, magicians and thought bringers and such, uh, similar to the, the classic martial arts stories in Hong Kong action, where you have the Shaolin temples and the heroes are like, hey, you guys are master martial artists. Why don't you help us out? And the Shaolin Temple people are like, no, we just stick to ourselves, right? And it might be like, no, why don't you come with us? It also might be like a Fey realm or port portal or something where the Fey are out there, New Orleans, partying, art, poetry, dance, music. This might be a mecca for, for a lot of uh, that kind of culture. And um, it could be, despite on the... Uh, because we, we have to have some conflict and adventure, right? On the surface, it may be a very um, egalitarian place. Oh, wow, it's just people having fun and partying all the time. Whereas, you, you know, um, as in real life, there might be people trying to tear other people down who are great musicians and artists, and it could be kill or be killed. Player What a great story to have player characters as bodyguards for a a pop culture icon in the fantasy realm, you know, or having to learn a song from a, a, a fae teacher slash harpy slash siren or something that only teaches so many students every, you know, um, every decade or whatever. Uh, AJ says, in some ways, the rail network is a magical gateway to far off places. Yes, uh, Eberron, not that we have to steal from Eberron, but yes, uh, the railroads, um, hell, here in the United States, um, rail, oil, coal, gold, you could recontextual. I mean, basically, those things um, kind of represent spice melange in Dune, and that could be a resource or um, a fantasy twisted resource 
that people were trying to gain as they spread across this fantasy realm. <laughs> yeah, pixie beat poets. <laughs> yeah, beatboxing and breakdancing and stuff. Hells yeah. Graffiti on the walls. I love it. AJ says, Fa- favorite for cafes playing magical jazz. Hells yes. Yeah, and and again, um, b- because of using the, excuse me, the hero's journey tends to be very martial, physical, warlike. But in the labyrinth, it could be very social or emotional. And so navigating, you know, the best artists and learn, learning how to talk with them, having, you know, how many times have players had small cups of tea or coffee or in cafes listening to jazz music, talking with their, their bitter enemies or maybe potential allies, uh, having, you know, simple conversations or something, right? So uh, there may also be physical arenas to express artistic content so in other words um pit fighting um archery um, open dance uh players may have to express themselves and their expressions garner them allies who may listen or may not listen to them based on how good they are so for example a a monk a classic monk or adept using martial arts and expressing their martial arts in a uh a uh, martial flourishes or the fencer who wins against five opponents or something like that. People may, you, you know, they do the little two finger clap in the palm of the hand with their nose in the air. And they're like, Oh yeah, we'll talk to you now. Mike says, uh, historically colonies founded by Britain were ruled directly by the British and cultures were made to be British. Yes, very much so. Uh, colonies founded by France were allowed to be the same so long as they pledge fealty. And mind you, this is, is, this mapping and information is formed heavily by uh, European standards. So this isn't this isn't a matter of like um, it doesn't take into account the writer of the book didn't take into account an overabundance of native peoples and players could be native peoples that are being overrun by by this kind of thing. So. There's very little information about this, but we're going to go here for the uh, British Caribbean. We're going down south in Spanish uh, Caribbean regions. And let's see here. Midlands, First Nations. Um, El Norte. It's not even written in Wikipedia. Wow. Wow. All right. Let's see if we have anything down here. See over in this other article. I've got two articles set up here so that I can just take a look at them. And they, wow, there really isn't any, they didn't even note any information about this. So f- from from my point of view, I would see the British Caribbean and Spanish, the, the Caribbean islands themselves. Of course, what, what do we have here? This is all, this is great piracy fodder, right? For our fantasy realms. Um, thousands of islands, big giant island nations with small islands off off the coast of them we we get our players on on ships and boats and uh privateers and all that kind of business um many of these islands were unfortunately settled and dominated by a particular um industry tobacco salt um coal uh, so on and so forth and a lot of um uh, enslaved people were taken here. Uh, uh, plantations, sugar, uh, very common for um, rum uh, production and tobacco production and things like that. And of course, salt was very big as well. So um, the the Caribbean island nations can be a microcosm of a larger nation so that each island could have its own uh, dominance, warlord, unchartedness, just going from place to place. Um, also, what a great way for um, uh, meta the meta gaming of players not being able to be involved in the adventure. They they just stayed on the ship at the end of every at the end of every session. If the players get back on the ship, you can have new players join in, or the the player that's been missing for three. Uh, three sessions comes back in because they've been, you know, handling things on a ship or a small island elsewhere. So great meta way to 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 finagle, you know, West Marches style. Like, hey, some players can um, pop in and out of a of a setting in which the same elements are happening over and over again. Also, um, huge hurricanes sweep through this area, coming from 
uh, coming from the east, from the coast of Africa, across the Atlantic Ocean, slamming into here. So you know you, you have to have some third pillar in, in, uh, third pillar encounters here with winds and floods and rains and tropical heat. So, uh, yeah, and a, a, a lot of these are islands are basically giant mountains poking up out of the ocean so you have island peaks and jungles and things like that so uh love that you you can you can make them as the islands as um overrun and civilized or uncharted and pri primordial as you would wish and what a great way to journey to these places or if you're from these places uncovering great secrets or escaping from these places either socially because people are like don't leave or um physically like because you're enslaved things of that nature so let's move up here and let's start moving westward and let's get into greater appalachia um so or uh, for for someone who's not from the area i call it appalachia but for those who live there to the appalachia so greater appalachia was populated by waves of immigrants that uh, Woodard calls borderlanders from the borders of Northern Ireland, Northern England, and Scottish lowlands. Greater Appalachia covers the highlands in the South uh, United States, the Southern parts of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, the Ozarks of Arkansas, and Missouri, most of Oklahoma, and Texas Hill Country. Its fighting spirit is embodied by figures such as Davy Crockett, Andrew Jackson, and Douglas MacArthur. Um, let's see. Let's see what this other article has to say. Uh, yeah, colonized by settlers from war-ravaged borderlands of Northern Ireland, Scottish lowlands. is the stere Greater Appalachia is stereotyped by the land of hillbillies and rednecks. Woodard says Appalachia values personal sovereignty and individual liberty and is, and is quote, intensely suspicious of lowland or aristocrats and Yankee social engineers alike. It sides with the Deep South to counter the influence of federal government. Within Greater Appalachia are parts of, and here we go with another list, Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, Arkansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, Indiana, Illinois, and Texas. And uh, Appalachia, I, I, um, again, here we go with a generalization, but Appalachia with very hilly, very mountainous, difficult terrain to live in, great to hide out in. This is a place since we're being very generalized, would be a great place where uh, goblinoid hordes um, hang out. This is where rangers and druids live. This is a place where um, establishing huge metropolitan areas might be very difficult um, because of the, the region. And it's not because it's lifeless. It's actually the opposite. It's because there's too much life. It's all hills, all rivers. It's all mountainous regions and caves and and things of that nature. And settled by people who are very chaotic. They they rail against you know all of the other regions here. The the um, the nobility of Tidewater. The the um, um, open mindedness of the the. The Netherland, the New Netherland region, without having any controls, it's all about the money. And Yank Yankeedom, it's all about utopia and and social engineering. And in the Deep South, it's it's about um, uh, petty warlords and um, you know trying to create their own little petty empires. And Greater Appalachia is just wild. And I could see it physically being very uh, primeval, very primal with you know, overgrown regions of all types. So not just forests, but you could include like forests and jungles. Uh, there's even, there's even little bits of plains, uh, large, huge swaths of plains where people can run um, long and far and not be held down by the, the, um, by the power of like uh, military and armies and, uh, and structures. And, uh, socially navigating this place might just be very nomadic individuals or seasonally nomadic. So they may sit for maybe uh, no more than weeks or months. Uh, maybe, you know, when winter hits, people move. Summer, they move back to another region. Also, uh, it may just be people who live in particular regions and they patrol their region in a spiral or a circular uh, manner, as well as 
having all of the traits of being uh, rangers, druids, nomads, uh, survivalists, but they stay in one place. Yeah, AJ's talking like, um, mentions like wood elves, wolfen, centaurs, treants, exactly. And maybe this region is a place where, you know, in fantasy, we often think of living plants and things like that as being evil. The people here might live in and around them. Hell, maybe in the branches of giant treants, right? And and living there. Um, also, I could see this being a uh, kill or be killed. So we don't often think of true neutral entities being enemies but they very may may well be maybe they see the player character suffering and they wait on the outskirts and see okay we're going to give them three days if they can survive three days in this uh, harsh landscape we just then we might speak to them but hey if they fall and get hurt or they're diseased or poisoned we're not going to lend, lend a hand right and it, this it also may be uh maybe they are social engineering without knowing it so Oftentimes, you can't have a tribe that's too big. So there might be infighting to break apart nomadic tribes. Uh, what's the what's the term? Um, um, in general, 100 human beings or less can work together without having a government. Once you start getting beyond that, you start having people break up into into chunks and 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 um, divisions and factions and things like that. So maybe there is a little bit of a very natural social engineering where you very rarely have more than a hundred people together, and they start to break up, um, uh, start to uh, break themselves apart. Uh, Mike says there's something to be said for recontextualizing existing settings into fantasy or sci-fi themes. Yes, it, this was a brain wig. It got into my head. It came across my feet again. I couldn't get rid of it. So I was like, Let, let's do this, <laughs> right? Recontextualizing these kind of things. AJ says the local tribe is making offerings to the nature spirits for religion. No, for survival, right? Ex exactly. Like from the outside, they're like, oh, they, they worship nature. And for the people there, they're like, we don't worship nature. Damn, we need to give a sacrifice because, or, or else, right? Like the, the only way we can... And maybe again, re recontextualizing things. Journey, journey, and labyrinth. Heroes, our heroes on their journey may, in their minds, they may be convinced you have to go and dominate this place. They need to be taken down. Everything's dangerous. But when you learn to live with them, a la um, Avatar, the the blue alien Avatar movies, Dances with Wolves, things like that. Maybe the offering to the treants. Their sap is poisonous and their, their fruit is poisonous. But if you all give a certain offering or feed them certain things, their fruits are, you eat the fruit, it's like a healing potion. You take their sap, it's uh, it hardens into amber that they use for their arrows or something. Like it, it could just be, it might be the same, but it's just different. Um, going back to the goblinoid hordes, uh, it, may be, it may be just, well, a normal thing civilized all the places on this east coast oh the goblinoid hordes are evil through here hey it's kill or be killed so when one group attacks the other group um it could be very they were talking about scottish lowlands and things like this very viking culture as well uh if you want to give a generalization and one group hey if you're not tough enough you just get dominated by the other group and if you get murder killed whatever you just get overrun and absorbed into the next group and everyone just says hey this is this is the normal way of life that could be a thing i'll move over to the midlands in just a minute <laughs> aj says welcome strangers we thank you for taking the place of sacrificing one of your own this year ready for the wicker man <laughs> exactly exactly right I, I i mentioned viking culture right hey we're, we're about to go north we we need a good tiding. We need to sacrifice someone, and you happen to be here, right? Um, uh, or hey, you want to you want to work with us? Where's your sacrifice? What do you do? You know, uh, Michael says this region would be the one barrier, perhaps preventing war between nations that border on Appalachia. Without these wilds, the Midlands and Deep South may come to war. Absolutely, absolutely, they, um. Uh, Greater Appalachia very much values their freedom. This is the place where everybody else runs from all the other places, right? It's 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 the freedom freedom realm. It's the you, what you're telling me what to do. We're going here, and 
it is the what is a uh, great game of thrones the iron bank region it's the realm created out of the free peoples from every other place uh what else do you guys have to say here um uh, Mike Gould says it may also justify New France having a vast navy. New France used water travel to connect their two regions as, as opposed to crossing Appalachia. Yeah, it's deadly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the mid-Mexico. <laughs> yep. I, I love it. I love it. Okay, so let's let's move on. Let's move on to the Midlands. Uh, this is kind of where I'm from, and my my and I bet you can tell my personality comes from the Midlands. So what are what are the Midlands? So the Midlands, founded by English Quakers, followed by the Pennsylvania Dutch, consists of southeast Pennsylvania, uh, uh, southern New Jersey, northern Delaware, Maryland, uh, north central Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, most of Iowa, and the eastern halves of South Dakota, Nebraska, and Kansas. Wow. As well as southern Ontario. Okay. The border city of Chicago is shared with Yankeedom. Uh, Midland promotes peaceful values and has often been in several elections the great swing region between Yankeedom and the Southern nations. Um, according to Woodward is culturally the most American of the nations. Uh, let's see what this other article has to say. Um, yeah. Settled by English Quakers, the Midlands are a welcoming middle-class society that spawned the culture of the quote, American heartland. Political opinion is moderate and government regulation is frowned upon. Uh, Woodward calls the ethnically diverse Midlands America's great swing region. And so what is the Midlands? The Midlands sounds to me, if you want to use very Dungeons and Dragony kind of things, uh, very neutral good. Um, it is the, the American heartland. But listen, w despite all that, and we're, we're going to get to El Norte down here with uh, Texas and things like that, greater Appalachia, because it does border on that. Uh, honestly, this this region, too. Heavily gun, greater Appalachian uh, in modern day, heavy gun states, Midlands, very well as, as much. I could see as far as um, the, the journey in the labyrinth that this is less lethal and more a test of one's strength and capabilities. In, in, so instead of a primeval here in greater Appalachia having more of a, a primeval style of region, I could see the Midlands being more cultivated and um, where instead of having wild realms, you may have people who, who take care of the land, but it has been, it's more of a, um, oh, what's, what's the region where someone owns so much land, they have a home and then they have a wild reach off of their, their land, like a, uh, a campus of sorts, um, a region where, where it's made up of so many different fantasy uh, cultures, um, ethnic cultures, and, and things of that nature where they get along. But within their own small region, it could be very difficult. For example, you may have a very civilized uh, city, um, not too much bigger than a village, but outside of it, list, you know, they tell the young people, you're going to have to learn to hunt. You're going to have to learn to live on your own. Um, hey, We've got wild creatures out there. The owl bears live out in this region. We need you to go out there and bring us back an owl bear cub or something. Like I could see this being being a very tested region, uh, especially um, tested and contested. Uh, I could see there being uh, political debates where you have people come in here, um, uh, diplomatic envoys speaking with other people, um, lots of trade, a uh, great. Uh, trade negotiations happening, merchants traveling from one region to another, a uh, back and forth. Even, even in fantasy realm, the way it's stretched long, you may have trade routes that go from, that go from the coast all the way into the Midlands. Um, the United States does have a, a pretty extensive river, uh, um, river uh, way to navigate inside the United States. But other than greater Appalachia, which may be like hilly and mountainous and dangerous to go through, you know, here in the Midlands, there's a lot of plains and a lot of open areas and may be very difficult to travel across it. I would even I would even borrow a lot of those uh, like having seven of the top most dangerous uh, creatures in the world uh, living out there in um, 
Australia, I'd populate this area as well and and steal a lot of the the cultural nuances, if you want to, um, cultural spikes as well from Australia and make this the Midlands where you have um, you, you, you uh, here in the Midlands back in the past. This was a dust bowl at one point. Uh, there was a thing known as the Black Blizzard that had people sick. Uh, there's um, lots of farmland is out here. Um, lots of flat areas here in Ohio Valley. It's very flat. We don't have very many hills and valleys and canyons and things. And that can be daunting as well to, to look ahead and see nothing but like scrublands and things. And the the various oases that are out here may also be a place for the players. Yeah, a river of dust. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, this may also be a place where it's very difficult to sneak up on people. And so the, the you know, creatures that fly through the air it may be very difficult to find uh, cover. Um, for uh, labyrinthine uh, adventures, not just the journey and journeying from one place to another and discovering your, um, uh, your, your physical skills, but in uh, labyrinth stories, it could be finding a culture out here. And, you know, with the cultures out here, they may be so different from each other and they might be very dense to get through, not offering very many answers. And someone may have to shed their old culture to become part of the of the new culture, as well as the fact that maybe there's so much space involved that it's easy for uh, an evil empire to begin and no one sees it. Right? They, they're, you know, if you can find your own oasis and s stay there and get your own cult started, or um, delve into your own um, uh, deep dark rituals, nobody else notices is it notices it and sees it. And so when people are are struggling traveling this you know, from east to west across this region, and they get to a place and just just when they're on their last legs, somehow somebody swoops in and picks them up and takes care of them. Welcome to my cult, <laughs> right? AJ says the planes are deadly, deadly not for for what they have or what they don't have. Yeah, they kill you with boredom. <laughs> exactly. Hey, you know, when when the greatest reward is just finding uh finding you know, shelter or water or food, or maybe just, just a place where I'm not sitting down and being stuck by plants or something like that, or, or putting my head on a rock pillow may, may, may be the thing. Also, um, um, endurance, um, mental endurance more than physical endurance may be the thing that, that gets people, uh, to, to travel through this region. All right. So we've done a lot of this. And as a matter of fact, you can very much tell we have, uh, we have here a lot of places that have been settled by a lot of different people because it came lots of individual from individual factions from the east settled and moved west. But now we have larger areas, vast larger areas, El Norte, the far west, the left coast. And if I can move here to the north of our map, First Nation. So um, not very much information about, let's say, the First Nation, but let's Let's see what they have to say. Uh, First Nation, founded by the predominant indigenous peoples in Canada, uh, south of the Arctic Circle, consists of much of Yukon, Northwest Territories, La Labrador, Nunavut, Greenland, uh, the northern tier of Ontario, Man 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 Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, uh, northwestern British Columbia, and the northern two-thirds of Quebec. It has preserve much better its culture and customs than the Native Americans in the United States. And not much else. Is anything else here? Uh, this other one, Far West. Yeah, made up of Na Native Americans. First Nations members enjoy tribal sovereignty. Um, but its population is under 300,000, most of whose people live in the northern reaches of Canada. Uh, Woodard says that among these 11 nations, Yankeedom and the Deep South exert the most influence and are constantly competing with each other for the hearts and minds of other nations. Yeah, not much is said about uh, First Nation members. Also, hey, when we want to go with, if, we, if we're going to go with this being settled by other peoples in our fantasy realms, these may be the oldest, cult. This, the First Nation may be the oldest culture uh, available in this entire fantasy realm. And the the 
the First Nations culture may look at these other new cultures as kind of a joke. Even even the people surviving in the Appalachia here, they may even look at them like, you're not survivalists, we're friggin' survivalists. And um, of course, because we tend to have uh, fantasy maps with the North being cold, the South being warm, we can also have this be our frozen region as well. <laughs> AJ says, uh, welcome to Hilltown. What do you mean, why is it called Hilltown? It has a hill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, talking about the Midlands. Yeah. We we have a place here called um oh um oh not hill, uh Plain City, and it is flat as all hell. Yeah, it's just flat. We Ohio Valley floods a lot. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um what else in First Nation? Okay, um also First Nation could be uh, could be so ancient that it borders on like the elemental planes. Like you could literally walk to the elemental planes because they are that, um, it is that intri intrinsic to the primeval building blocks of our fantasy realm that you don't need to use a spell to travel to another world. Maybe you just walk there. And the people here could have, uh, could literally have blood related to uh, the, the creation of this world by the demigods of, of um, ancient lore or something of that nature. Also, with First Nation, this may be the place for where you go when you are guilt-ridden and traumatized. We're talking about the hero's journey in the labyrinth as another journey. A physical journey may be required to go on a mental journey to absolve oneself. Atonement, meditation, uh, self-enlightenment, um, punishment, self, uh, self punishment. This may be the, 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 the lonely realm where you go and are found by others because of your, your desire to find out who you are and what you are in the world. Um, heck it, it, it could be the, it, it could be the realm of, uh, tier four 16th to 20th level characters because they've gone off because they've gotten bored or, uh, become cynical uh, they've done everything they could in the lower realms of this, this new world and going up into the first nation world to meet people up here who are just like, yeah, you, you realized it, you know, 17th level Inuit peoples are going like, now you get it. Don't you? Yeah. Come on, come on in, <laughs> have a seat. And all it is, is just a giant plane of snow and uh, snow and, and, and wind blowing across and two people talking with each other. Uh, also first nation could be a place Hey, we're you, Game of Thrones, right? With the wall and pretend this could be a place with a building danger that if the other places below don't work together could suffer the wrath of a huge invasion, war, um, unsettlement, portal, whatever that could, could flood, you know, miles, leagues thousands of kilometers, whatever, and just engulf the rest of everything below. So uh, th that could also be a, a place of uh, building horror. Heck, it could even be a, a dead god rises once again and, and walks upon the world or something of that nature. Here we have a huge area. I'm not going to read all the states here in the far west. So lastly, here in the far west, we're going to run through this. Um, mm -mm -mm. Far west is the interior of the United States and Canada, west of the 100th meridian between El Norte and First Nation. There's a ton of states. The region has been imperialized by other nations, such as Yankeedom and Deep South, with large mining and infrastructure projects. The Mormon enclave has been its politically, it's been its politically most influential group. Um, here we go. Far... Far West. Uh, the conservative West developed through large investment in industry, yet where inhabitants continue to resent the Eastern interest that initially controlled that investment. And so um, out here in the far West, we get Silicon Valley. We get here, here, here is Dune, right? This is the far West is, is, is resource extraction and Dune and uh, cultish enclaves. So out here you have uh, people who are hoarding water, oil, gold, um, mining resources, intellectual resources, uh, um, the, the, um, 
Silicon Valley. Um, we have people who uh, are pushed out here on reservations, uh, living out here who have been um, forced away from other places. Exiles would be out here in the far west, uh, much like the Midlands, but far less life ex exists out here. Lots of space. M the vast majority of the United States lives in every other place except the far west. Uh, less than half of the whole population in the United States lives out here in the far west uh, um, in reality. And with great space comes vast reaches of where people don't see what you're doing. The difference between, I would say, greater Appalachia, which is overgrown, the Midlands, which would have um, harvested campuses, and uh, the First Nation, which is very far north. The difference is this is very hot, is very arid, and dominated by industry. So you have a lot of entrepreneurs and people coming from the eastern part, Yankeedom, New Netherlands, even the Tidewater and Deep South coming out here and dominating the resources that are out here, which are, are necessary for people to live. And so I could see gold, silver, um, um, mining operations done out here. Uh, again, um, Maybe there's something arcane being dug out here. Mage stones. I'm just making this up. Pull this out of my ass. Uh, let me pull a big giant mage stone out of my ass to from the far west being taken and pulled to the libraries of of um, the New England region. Or maybe the deep south are have uh, warlords that are looking for great power and they're trying to steal these mage stones to use to power their um their uh, arcane power to keep the people um, under their thumb in their uh, their their little uh, fiefdoms and such like that. Uh, the, the far west, I would even say this: we have how many times in fantasy have we had a vast war or an uh, arcane apocalypse or something like that? A lifeless region that's been wiped out, and the far west really. Uh, dictates that a vast war could have happened in your fantasy region that no longer exists. Um, and there's just the remnants of things stuck in the dust and dirt and grime um, in this region. Maybe there was a great empire. Um, Atlantis comes to mind where, you know, high tech devices can be found, you know, tech, High tech so advanced that is indistinguishable from magic could also be out here. And the journeys to go across here may test people uh, physically, mentally, use their willpower. I, I would think that labyrinthine storytelling out here would be um, the Mormon enclaves as a, as a uh, fantasy substitute would be uh, cult regions. Uh, the industrialized areas going out here and finding out that they they have like um, places being used by um, uh, entrepreneurs and industrialists and stuff, corporate entities in, in a fantasy realm and trying to organize the people to free themselves. Um, also, there may be these enclaves that seem like utopias, but they really aren't because people are giving up, uh, giving up their freedom uh, giving up their minds or maybe even their memories, uh, losing themselves. And the player characters must go here to recover lost loved ones that are part of these cults. And they're always smiling. Hello, how are you? Join us in, in our um, in our hippie uh, commune. And you realize that it's being run by hags or rakshasa or fiends or something like that, stealing a little bit of their life every moment as they give up their... Uh, their life. And then we have El Norte, and then we're going to end with the left coast. So El Norte is where the oldest European subculture in the United States is found. The uh, early Catholic Spanish settlers in the 16th century, later augmented by Anglo-Americans from Deep South and Greater Appalachia. It includes South and West Texas, uh, Southern California, and its Imperial Valley. And it goes on to places like Baja, California, Nuevo Leon, uh, uh, Chihuahua, New Mexico, parts of Colorado, Southern Arizona. Um, this would be, El Norte could be very considered very religious, um, settled by uh, um, religious freedom and settling these places and a very, very culturally um, deep and such, ha maybe having sailed here from the other places and settled. And I would have, I would say fantasy wise, the El Norte could be very religiously bound um, for good or bad. 
and there could even be uh, religious conflicts happening between the different places that have been settled here and the creatures and monsters and even otherworldly beings that are allies with those uh, beings and um, and players being allied or enemies of those religious institutions. Um, if you yin, if you yin yang your places, the good people could have something pretty despicable going on. Uh, a goodly people that created a utopia, but they they sacrifice a young one, you know, their youngest member once a year, or um, uh, the yin yanging of it very dark with something good. Maybe there's a very evil uh, conspiratorial culture here, uh, v very warlocks centered with fiends, but they're offering power for freedom to free people. For example, maybe in El Or El Norte, they're freeing people from the deep south, and maybe even agents that have uh, infiltrated uh, the the Tidewater region of slavery. And this evil uh, religion is empowering these people to free themselves to move into greater, greater Appalachia. Although the, maybe the greater plot is that they end up going in a big circle back to El Norte, to their region. But, but you know, greater plot there. Um, and, and, and for a labyrinthine thing could be unraveling the and telling the difference between the evil uh, that has maybe embedded itself in the good religions or the evil religions and extracting the good people from those evil religions. And I'm doing that very generally. La lastly, we have the left coast <laughs> and left coast was predominantly settled by Yankees from New England with a huge influx from greater Appalachia and countries around the world when gold was discovered. It encompasses a land between the Pacific Ocean, Pacific Coast rain ranges from Monterey, California to Juneau, Alaska. And what else does it say? Um, left coast, left coast, left coast. Uh, colonized by New Englanders and Appalachian Midwesterners, left coast is a hybrid of Yankee utopianism and Appalachian self-expression and exploration. Um, gold, definitely, definitely uh, uh, resource extraction, de definitely entertainment capital world, Hollywood and such. Uh, people wanting to live free on their own, but a lot of conflict between that as well. Um, you know, the enter being an entertainment capital of the world, you know, there is a lot of conflict and it could be very lethal conflict with who dominates that kind of, uh, of thinking. Also with free thinkers that want to settle themselves out here in, in the quote unquote gold coast, um, any place where you got gold extraction and mines, you've got people murdering each other. What, what other kinds of things could be extracted? Gold, diamonds, mage stones, whatever. Um, and, and especially places, people that are rich enough to establish themselves as maybe there's not nobility out here, but it's all about who's the richest, who's got the power, who who has the most influence when it comes to money. Um, also, the beautiful people, the, the charismatic people, maybe not politically, but entertainment wise, pe per personality rules everything, maybe out here. Um, you, people who are famous for being famous, right? And uh, that could be part of Left Coast. So, Anyway, guys, I wanted to show this to you. Uh, it, it again, I was saying like it's it, it was kind of a, a brain wig in my head, and I thought it would be a little bit of a and a little bit of a way to go a, a, a little bit away from the journey and labyrinth that we had talked about Monday and yesterday. Uh, of course, tomorrow is going to be uh, world building. Uh, uh, sheesh, my brain. Um, tomorrow is going to be Future Friday. Uh, We'll definitely do with the hero's journey and labyrinth there, especially if the hero's journey takes us dis distant world to planets and the uh, a labyrinthine adventure takes us deep inside maybe a um, abandoned starship or a an alien culture or something like that. So I wanted to show you this, guy, this to you guys. I thought it would be pretty interesting, pretty di different. There are YouTubes, um, YouTube and podcasts about talking about uh, this particular thing as well uh, about the eleven, the eleven nations in the United States um, and how they are described. So uh, it, you know, you might want to check that out as well, guys. I want to thank you so much for being part of the show. Have a great day. I'll see you later.